Welcome to California Now, a podcast produced by Visit California. I'm Satirius Johnson. This episode is all about California's delicious diversity. We'll start with Chef Tanya Holland of Brown Sugar Kitchen in Oakland. She tells us about her new projects, which include a new cooking show and the new season of her podcast. I love talking to people from different backgrounds and finding common denominators. You know, that's what I love when I can be out in the dining room or, you know, when I dine out and talking to people. Then San Diego chef Claudette Zepeda, who many will remember from Bravo's Top Chef, will discuss her soon to open restaurant in Encinitas called Vaga. The concept behind Vaga is really a love letter San Diego and the food that you can find throughout the county by using the inspiration of international ingredients that have migrated to our coast. After that, Lauren Herpick tells us why food tours are a great way to explore a destination, whether you're in from out of town or right in your own backyard. That's all coming up on California Now. You can't talk about California's delicious diversity without including Chef Tanya Holland. If you didn't catch her on the very first episode of our podcast, you might have seen her on Top Chef or the Food Network or on her new show, Tanya's Kitchen Table, on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Chef Tanya owns and runs Oakland's Brown Sugar Kitchen. She's authored two cookbooks, and her podcast, Tanya's Table, just launched its second season. Welcome back to California Now, Tanya. Hi, Satirius. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. So, you know, to start out, a lot of restaurants have had to scramble over the last year due to the pandemic. Tell us a little bit about how you've made the pivot. Well, we've done very similar uh, things as everybody else. We just start offering takeout. Um, We started using delivery services and we offered, um, you know, uh, outdoor seating and we built a parklet you know, it's just, it's just been a cycle, you know, of unknowns and we're just, we're looking for other revenue streams. There's some mail order companies that uh, deliver cross country. Um, We're looking at starting some consumer packaged goods, but um, we just really have to watch our inventory and, you know, uh, negotiate with our landlord and do the best that we can. Right, right. I mean, I know it has not been easy, but, you know, you have your own podcast now. I really want to talk about that and your new show on OWN. And um, so why don't we start with with the latter, with the podcast? How do you like life as a podcaster? Yeah, that is, um, you know, it just kind of happened. It was just synergistic that I was talking to the production company prior to COVID. And then when COVID went on lockdown, you know, we were kind of set to for me to start recording. And because, you know, everybody was locked down, I was able to access people that I normally wouldn't have as much access to. So that was, that was great. Um, And, you know, I love talking to people from different backgrounds and finding common denominators. You know, that's what I love when I can be out in the dining room or, you know, when I dine out and talking to people. Um, So it's just an extension of that. And just to get to know a little bit of the different side of these personalities and they get to know me a little bit. So it's it's been, you know, pretty fun. It's been pretty fun. Yeah. And it sounds like, you know, not only learning about their personalities, but also, you know, giving you a chance to put your full personality on display, too, and encourage your guests Absolutely. to, you know, let themselves be a little more, let their hair down a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm multidimensional, you know, and I just feel like, you know, sometimes chefs, we, people only think of us in one way and they don't know what, uh, what else interests us. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a nice way for yeah me to be heard and seen. And and you've talked with some really big names. I mean, Samin yeah. Nasrat, yeah. Alice Waters, Aisha Curry. Um, yeah. Who are some of the, the standouts in your mind and why? Well, it's funny, you know, I mean, these are all like my neighbors and friends. Uh, I run into Samin in the market all the time. And, um, you know, at first she said no, she wasn't doing anything new. And I was like, well, Alice and Danny Meyer said yes. (laughs) And so uh, she agreed to. And we had a really wonderful conversation. Um, You know, we have a a lot in common. And, you know, Aisha just opened a store around the corner from me. Um, Alice and I have done a number of, you know, events together and, um, I've just been, yeah, fortunate to have these great conversations. That's really cool. I mean, you've also talked with longtime Oakland activist, Erica Huggins. Um, tell us about that. Well, I mean, sadly I had to cut our conversation after like 
over an hour. I was like, Erica, <laughs> I have to go. Oh, you know? that's so but, funny. Oh, I could have talked to her for hours. Tell, for she, people who don't know, tell us, tell, tell, tell yeah, us a little Erica. bit about her. Yeah. Erica was in the Black Panthers and, you know, she was jailed in her early 20s after she had just given birth to her daughter. She taught herself yoga while imprisoned. Uh, she continued to be an activist, was part of the, you know, the school breakfasts. Um, and she's been a regular customer of mine. And in the podcast, I didn't even get to the part of her son worked for me for about a year, you know, <laughs> oh, and wow. we didn't even get to talk about that. I talk about Rasa. He's a nice guy. He has his own coffee shop. Um, but yeah, she's very inspiring. She's, you know, her, she's just, education is really her focus, um, and healthful living and balance and just a wonderful woman. So to open season two, you know, you spoke with Aisha Curry. What was that conversation like? Yeah, it was really great to catch up with Aisha. You know, I follow her from afar and, um, I knew she was planning to open up a store around the corner from me. It's a nesting store. So, uh, homewares, home goods, uh, tabletop, blankets, pillows, and there's a little coffee kiosk. So we've been in touch about her, welcoming her to the neighborhood. Um, but it was just great. I mean, it was just catching up with like, you know, a colleague, you know, what are you looking for into business? How's it going? You know, how are you juggling this? Um, she learned a lot about me. I don't think she knew, you know, that I had trained in France, mm. uh, how long I've been in the business and, um, some of my other things. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a great conversation, very organic, which is what I like. That's great. And you know, that's great that your shops are so close to each other, your restaurant, and her shop. So like you can kind of hang out maybe now. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> it's fun. So let's shift gears now to, to your new TV show, Tanya's kitchen table. Um, for folks who haven't seen it yet, what makes it unique? Well, I think, you know, because of the time of COVID and the restrictions on production, um, you know, it was a straight up cooking show, which is like we call it a stand and stir, which I wasn't that excited about. I really love being around people and being out in the field, but they gave me the license to um, have some friends as guests. So hmm. I had one friend every episode and, you know, they came in at the third or fourth act and we just had a little conversation over food, very much like my podcast, um, except that. These are, you know, people that uh, no one else knows who they are, but they know me. And I really look forward to that. You know, it was fun to get through the recipes and then sit down mm. just, just as if they were a guest in my home. That's really great. So you're just breaking bread after making it and you're just, exactly. you know, just hanging out and talking. Exactly. And, and, the, and the topics don't necessarily have to do with the, what you just made. You're just talking about anything, right? That's, that's right. Like, how have you been? What's new? You know, just like, you know, if your friend dropped by. Right. Oh, that's really great. Can you tell yeah. us about one or two of the dishes you cooked on the show that you're especially proud to share with the world? Well, I, I will tell you that I was contacted by the talent uh, scout uh, mid-September and a week later, I was offered the show, and two weeks later, we were taping it. Wow, and, that's pretty fast. And it, was on, it was on air. We, yeah. <laughs> so everybody in that production said they never worked that fast before. And because I had a cookbook, it made it so much easier for the culinary producer. Mm -hmm. So most of the recipes were taken from the cookbook. So it really wasn't like, you know, reinventing the wheel. I, you know, I love the dish that uh, the one chef I had on, my friend Dusky Estes, who is uh, based in Sonoma. We made, we did a badass brunch and we did <laughs> eggs Benedict and we used her sustainably, uh, you know, uh, raised bacon or she makes bacon from st sustainably raised uh, pigs. <laughs> and it was delicious because that's not normally, you know, usually use, you know, Canadian bacon or ham or something for um, an eggs Benedict. So that was really nice. And it was grits Benedict as well. Oh. It's, it, wasn't, it wasn't made with um, English muffins. It's made with uh, grits that you cool and then you batter and then you uh, slightly fry them in a pan. So oh, it was great. That sounds great. Kind of like yeah. a really cool different spins in one dish of a classic dish. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, what's your favorite thing about working on the show? I love all the moving parts. You know, it. It takes a lot of focus and there's so many different people doing different things. Um, you know, you've got producers, directors, camera, sound, you know, makeup, uh, you know, wardrobe. Uh, I've got, I'm sitting there trying to, you know, 
kind of remember the the points that they want me to make uh, during the the few minutes that I'm on camera. Um, so I really, yeah, I really enjoy that. It's just a different. It's it's much different than working in a restaurant. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I have to ask you: Have you met Oprah yet? No, everybody asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's you not. Uh, but uh, I'm looking forward to the day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. So Tanya, I hear you have just been voted onto the board of the James Beard Foundation. What are you doing as uh, a member of the board, and what's the uh, foundation doing in this time of pandemic? Yeah, it's it's very cool. It's such an honor to be on the board, and as part of that, I've become my new role is chair of the awards, which is just like astounding to me. I'm the chair of all the James Beard Awards, <laughs> which wow. means I get to have attend a lot of meetings and. You know, we're doing a full audit soon. We're just going to discuss, uh, you know, the future of the awards. Um, we didn't do them last year because of the pandemic. Um, we have some different programming in mind for this year. Uh, but the foundation is really focused on, you know, making an impact. Obviously, COVID has highlighted how fragile the industry is, um, but also our contribution to the economy. But we've got to fix some of the systems. So, so when you talk about fixing the systems, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, you know, the big focus is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, you know, historically, some of the same people have had access to uh, the funding. So we've started a, a Black and Indigenous uh, investment fund. And also, you know, talking about how, um, you know, the, the, this industry is just so fragile. And so there needs to be programs that can provide operators with, you know, some kind of security for staying in business, uh, landlord deals, things like that. The list is so long. Right. A lot of important, sounds like a lot of important work. Yeah. I'm excited to be a part of it. So Tanya, it sounds like you have so much going on. You're so busy, but is there anything else that, that you need to tell us about? Yeah, actually, I know I am very busy, but I'm loving everything I'm doing and I am planning to open up uh, the cafe at the Oakland Museum of California. And I'm very excited about it. I mean, speak of delicious diversity. Uh, one of the reasons why I was selected is because I am going to be moving away from just cooking soul food and really uh, cook food that represents the diversity of Oakland. So, you know, Oakland, there's over 100 languages spoken here. There's so many different uh, ethnicities represented. And I want everybody to be represented. So you might see Thai noodles. You might see... Uh, an Ethiopian dish on it. You might see some naan. I'm not sure, but I'm going to get a chance to play around. That sounds really exciting. I mean, I'm sure just like the thought of being able to delve into these other cuisines that you may or may not have ever had experience with before. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if I don't, I have lots of colleagues locally that I want to bring in to do some collaborations right. with. Um, and, you know, I have a pretty diverse repertoire and also it's going to be plant-based forward, which is, you know, I'm just really focusing on sustainability and, um, you know, we've got to start thinking about this and the, the chef community, the restaurant community has a, a great opportunity to play an impact on global warming. That sounds so great. Tanya, thank you so much for uh, joining us again here on California Now. Thank you. It was great talking to you. Chef Tanya Holland owns and runs Brown Sugar Kitchen in Oakland. She hosts the podcast, Tanya's Table. And her TV show, Tanya's Kitchen Table, is on OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. When it comes to Southern California's delicious diversity, San Diego is a melting pot of amazing flavors, cultures, and styles. My next guest is on a mission to capture that essence with her next culinary project. You might have seen Chef Claudette Cepeda competing on TV's Top Chef and Top Chef Mexico. Her accolades include a Michelin bib gourmand, and she was 2018 Chef of the Year in both the San Diego Union Tribune and Eater San Diego. Welcome to California Now, Claudette. Thanks for having me. Sure. So, so you're the executive chef at a beachfront resort opening soon in San Diego. Before we get to that, though, could you tell me a bit about some of your culinary stops along the way? I mean, you've worked at some acclaimed places in San Diego. I have. I have. I have been fortunate enough to work with some amazing humans here in San Diego. In that time, I've worked with, you know, El Biscocho with Gavin at Jack's La Jolla, which was a big 
three-story restaurant with multiple concepts with one pastry studio and I was a pastry cook there that's where I really sunk my teeth into the fine dining and the I saw what food could be in that part of San Diego um, I opened uh, Pier South in Imperial Beach as a hotel. That's when I went to the savory side. I worked at, as a pastry chef at J6 in downtown. Uh, opened Bracero in Little Italy. And uh, most notably, my last restaurant, El Jardin, which opened in 2018 and closed in 2019. Hmm. It's a lot. I mean, it's really, a really great experience. And how much did being on Top Chef help, like in terms of people getting to know who you are? Well, I think it, it, it definitely helps. That's why most chefs realize the weight that that title carries. And it becomes, you, you become a part of a fraternity authority of a bunch of chefs. And, and definitely it helps bring people into the restaurant. You know, it's out of curiosity. People want uh, familiarity with chefs and uh, it really humanizes us. So it definitely helped bring people into the restaurant. Top Chef Mexico, not so much because uh, it wasn't viewed in the States. But I did right, get a lot right, of right, right. Mexican uh, clientele come in after that, too. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I read that being on, on Top Chef Mexico was especially meaningful to you. How, how is that? It was. Uh, I was at a point in my career where I had uh, just finished uh, my tenure at uh, Bracero, and I really wanted to go all in uh, for my culture, for my roots, and, you know, that cultural anthropology side that I love. And then I went to Top Chef Mexico uh, with really no expectations. I had no idea. I was kind of scared out of my wits. And uh, getting there and seeing, you know, all these contestants, there's 15 of us, uh, they, we all grew up the same. We all spoke the same language. We all had so many. It was like you were in a competition with your cousin. <laughs> and I learned so much of my culture, so much of what I was capable of. And I left with you know, 15 loves of my life, just like friends that will be my friends forever. Wow, that sounds so great. It almost sounds like you were like connecting with like, you know, long lost relatives or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Claudette, let's turn now to your new role as executive chef at Alila Morea Beach Resort in Encinitas. Can you start with a quick overview of the property? Yeah, so Alila Morea is in Encinitas on one of the most beautiful bluffs. It's like a, you know, the hotel sits on an infinity pool. That's what it looks like. You look out at the end of the bluff, it's super long. So you get to the end of it where the pool bar sits and all you see is the Pacific never ending. And it's 130 keys. So generally speaking, it's a small resort. It's a uh, luxury property focused on wellness and uh, pretty eco as far as our day-to-day life and running an operation, you know, no single-use plastic. Um, The concept, the Lila, the brand, started in Southeast Asia and Bali. And uh, really the ethos of it is, you know, zero to landfill, be as, eat as good as you can be, and, you know, local, hyper-local. Like, you can open a restaurant, but Lila Maria is so much, is demanding so much more of us, of, you know, earth-conscious, water conservation, no single-use plastic, all these things. So it's a, it's a really special property. It has its magic. Um, and the beach down, you know, Aponto South is, I've found some of the most beautiful rocks I've ever seen. It's a very rocky beach, not super sandy. And we're using that into our plate integration. And you go down the jetties and you can see the, you know, micro life. You see urchin, you see tiny little baby octopus on the rocks. And it's really special. Now, the signature restaurant uh, you're in charge of there at the resort is called Vaga. Uh, mm-hmm. What does that name mean to you? Vaga. So Vaga is something that you're called as a child. If you're, I mean, if you're a boy, it's Vago. If you're a girl, it's Vaga. And it's a, a term of endearment in my family, meaning that I was always running around the streets. I was never home. It was, I, you know, the, my brothers and I would leave at sun up and then we would come back as sun was setting and always this curiosity and hunger for life and, uh, you know, experience over things. And my grandmother used to call me a vaga. I would call her, you know, to give her a rundown of what my life was right before she passed and you know, what was going on. And she would, the first sentence, she didn't speak English, but she would say, Anda de vaga, meaning you're out running around. 
And I was, <laughs> I would just joke and I'd say, Grandma, always, like always. Right. So it's, it's almost like a shortened version of the word vagabond in English or something kind of like you're just always all over the place. Right. Yeah. Rolling Stone, you know, gathers no moss, all those cliche phrases. Uh, and actually the etymology of the word has something to do with uh, waves as well. So it just was very oh. serendipitous, but it all worked out. So what's the concept behind Vaga? The concept behind Vaga is really a love letter San Diego and the food that you can find throughout the county uh, by using the inspiration of in international ingredients that have migrated to our coast. It sounds like you're bringing together all of the amazing foods that San Diego is known for. Um, what can you tell us about the inspiration behind that? So that you know came to be a very organic process of just looking around and realizing the, the stuff that I ate growing up uh, was, you know, Ponset and Thrifty's ice cream at the, you know, after church on Sundays and my mom cooking a bunch of different ethnicities, cuisines, and then we would have, you know, our staples of the things that we just knew, pozole, chilas, huitas, all those dishes that obviously come from our roots and it started evolving from there and then and then it had to be fine-tuned right because i have to be able to explain it my staff has to be able to explain it so it really is you know that san diego love letter as a border town to everyone that comes into our property being inspired by the amount of ingredients that are at our disposal through migrations of hundreds thousands of ethnicities now, I know the menu is still in the R&D phase, but can you give us a hint or two about what we might look forward to? One of my favorite dishes that I'm super excited about R&D is a jollof rice using West African spices. And I had it in London and it was one of those dishes that I couldn't stop eating. And I, it was so soul satisfying, so warm that I just, I had to figure out how it was done. And I have a couple of friends that do a beautiful West African cuisine and are really focused on the spices and where it comes from. So I'm excited for the jollof rice with a spicy crab and uni sauce, uh, like an uni custard um, here, local uni, of course, uh, Baja crab. Uh, what else do I have? I have a crispy gnocchi with some charred celery root. So we're working with some of the local farms to grow stuff just for us, you know, bring in seeds that, I mean, I had a, tons of seeds from El Jardin. So I have a beautiful like celery root, charred celery root in our wood fire oven with some crispy Parisian gnocchi, um, lots of herbs, really plant forward, plant based forward. Uh, I have the seared scallops that, you know, Saraspi Seafood, one of my favorite vessels families here locally. And they they have some of the most beautiful seafood bounty. So we've got seared scallops with a plantain puree and some toasted chocolate corn, which is this giant. Peruvian corn that it looks like hominy, but it's chewy. Hmm. It's, the texture is just so beautiful. Um, and then finish off with a chili oil that we do in house. Uh, oxtail soup dumplings. So, obviously, soup dumplings are Chinese delicacy, but I grew up in Tijuana where Chinese Mexican culture is uh, so intertwined. It's, it, it is one. So, I started, you know, riffing off of what can the soup be. And then uh, Carmen Zucugo is one of my very iconic, you know, Jalisco style dishes, one of my favorites to do. So a braised oxtail soup dumpling with a tomatillo broth and heirloom beans on the, um, in the broth. That's just some of the stuff. I don't want to give too much away, but those are some of the most, like the highlights of what I'm most excited about. Besides wow, the that sounds really great. Yeah. Are, are there like certain neighborhoods around town or places where you ate growing up that are on your mind as you've been kind of sculpting this idea? For sure. So Imperial Beach, San Isidro, um, Chula Vista is the area that I grew up in. And then you have, you know, Convoy, which has the best dumplings. Uh, you can get the amazing Korean barbecue. Uh, then you go, I, I didn't really venture super north. North County is still, I'm trying to get the lay of the land up here. Uh, but I would say like that Convoy downtown uh, and then South Bay for sure was mm, a focal mm -hmm. point for me. I mean, being right by the ocean and near so many amazing farms, you have a lot of incredible options when it comes to getting ingredients. So so what are some that stick out to you? We're going to be using Cyclops Farm, Chino Farm, obviously, that they're a big wish list kind of a farm that I've always wanted to work with. And they're closer to me now, so that's happening. Uh, Girl and Doug Farms in San Marcos are also going to be a very 
much so on the menu. Like I, Girl and Doug, I, I got to go and spend the day with the family of Girl and Doug and seeing what they can do in those hoop houses and what, how, what they're trying to do creatively with working with chefs is incredibly inspiring. Uh, then mm -hmm. you have proteins with Cook Pig Ranch with, uh, and Julian, uh, Pasture Bird Farms in Marietta with chickens that they have one of the, my favorite chicken programs uh, that is actually free range, actually organic, and they produce an amazing tasting chicken. So that's just the highlight. Yeah. And you mentioned Chino. That's uh, that's in Rancho Santa Fe, I think. And that's huge with big name chefs. I mean, a lot of big name chefs love to go there to source products because the quality is just so amazing. Yeah. And it's always been a hard read for me since I've been pretty far south and you've got to, you know, go pick up the produce, go look at it, touch it and talk to the family and uh, being even downtown to Rancho Santa Fe, it was quite a trek. So now it's kind of right near us. So it's perfect. <laughs> Before we let you go, could you share one or two experiences that anyone wanting to appreciate San Diego's delicious diversity ought to have? Ooh, so you have to go eat tacos in San Diego. There's all these different taco shops. And obviously we're a taco shop culture. We're a border town. And, mm -hmm. But you really, if you want to see what that TJ style taco, you got to go south. If you want really good tacos, go to Chula Vista. Taco El Gordo does it right. That's the, they were originally from Tijuana and uh, they still do, you know, the spit for the alabala which is the pastor pork taco, they do lengua, they do exactly what you would expect uh, without going to Mexico and crossing the border. And um, right. if you want to get some of the best Asian cuisine a convoy, you can't miss it. You can really do this entire like restaurant hop down convoy, you know, going to Jasmine for dim sum. If you like traditional dim sum carts, um, dim sum is traditionally in the morning. So you, one of my favorite ways to start my day. Um, then, and, you know, Japanese sushi, sushi Oda and PB, very quintessentially San Diegan, uh, San Diego iconic spot, sushi Oda and, you know, Otao San is one of the, the people that have left Oda have opened their own sushi restaurants, but under his tutelage and it's one of my favorite sushi spots. That's a really great advice. I mean, so you can hit so many great places and not so uh, big an area. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Claudette, this has been really great. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great talking to you guys. Claudette Zepeda is executive chef at Alila Morea Beach Resort and Sanitas in San Diego. The resort is now taking reservations at alilahotels.com. You can find more about Claudette at chefclaudettezepeda.com. She's also on Instagram at Claudette Zepeda. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. One great way you can learn about a city's best bites and the cultures and cuisines behind these delicacies is through guided food tours. Booking a food tour on your next getaway or even in the town where you live will most certainly introduce you to new flavors in a fun, highly social setting. My next guest, Lauren Herpick, is founder and owner of Local Food Adventures. She's here to give us an overview of the food tour scene, both in the Oakland area and across the state. Welcome to California Now, Lauren. Thanks, Sotirius. Thanks for having me. Sure. So let's start out with something super basic. What exactly is a food tour? How do you describe the experience to the uninitiated? So a food tour, um, at least for me, is a guided tour. So you have a tour guide and we take you through different neighborhoods um, to different restaurants, specialty shops, marketplaces, so that you learn about a neighborhood and a city through food. That sounds really great. It's like a crash course in like everything you need to know if you're a foodie. Oh, absolutely. But also, it's not just about food, too. It's everything you want to know about a neighborhood. I mean, the best way of learning about a new place is through the food. It's when you're sitting down at a table together, you're having conversation, you're learning about the people that make up um, a certain place. And so, you know, it's more than just the food. It's the facts. It's the fun. It's the people. That's really great. So and your operation is based in Oakland. What makes it a good location for these types of tours? 
Oakland is just a very vibrant and diverse city, and there's so many different pockets. You know, you have the Jack London Square Brewing District, you have Chinatown, you have Old Oakland, which is a neighborhood that's right in downtown Oakland that so many people would not even know existed. You have, um, you know, more suburban residential neighborhoods like Rockridge and Piedmont. Um, You have the vibrant Grand Lake, which is the gem of Oakland and so many great neighborhoods and so many great restaurants and shops that make up those neighborhoods that it just, it's so natural to want to bring people there to really experience what, you know, really Oakland is all about. So it's a diversity of of cuisines, a diversity of people, sometimes, you know, a diversity of all of that just, you know, within feet of each other. Yeah. And I think, you know, what I love too is, um, you know, a lot of my tour guests are California locals and also Bay Area locals. So they're discovering neighborhoods that, you know, some people have lived in forever and they'll say, wow, I've never been to this, you know, shop or I've lived here my whole life and I didn't know that, you know, I I provide a lot of history on my tours. And so that's always, you know, a a massive, you know, review plus is when I hear something like that. But then also from people from outside the area to know that, you know, the Bay Area has so much to offer. We have San Francisco, we have Napa, we have Muir Woods, we have Oakland and the East Bay. And so I want it to be a place that people also get excited to come out and visit. So, so when you're taking people on these tours um, and they're experiencing the diversity of the food and the people, are they actually interacting with, you know, the people who are making the food or is it really more like just being uh, kind of in this ambiance of, you know, uh, a, a different culture? No, I mean, that's something I very wanted to have part of my tours is that people would actually be able to get to know and get to meet the cheesemongers at Market Hall Foods. I mean, these are the experts. I mean, I love food. I love giving tours. I'm an expert in giving tours and doing a lot of research, but these are the people that live, breathe, and eat cheese all day. And so if you <laughs> if you have any burning cheesy questions, these are the people that you got, you want to ask them. And you know what's great too is that I get to learn from them too. So, you know, on a personal side bonus, anytime that, you know, my husband and I are invited to a party, I am always in charge of supplying the cheese board because I know <laughs> I know what to make thanks to my uh, my cheesemonger friends. Um that's but no, great. that that's really important to me is so that people, you know, one of the highlights of, you know, my my original tour is a tour in the Rockridge neighborhood in Oakland and they get a private seated experience with a chef at a 16 Rockridge and a 16 is a beautiful restaurant. It's Michelin guide recommended. Um, it's won a James Beard award for its wine program. And, you know, they get to come into the restaurant before it opens. They sit with, you know, they sit, sit at chef's counter, talk with the pizzaiolo, see how they make these really authentic Neapolitan wood fired pizzas. And they get that private experience and they always leave saying, wow, like I never would have had that, you know, going to, you know, just, you know, a, you know, a restaurant at normal business hours, just being able to have that time makes it really, really special. And that's something I definitely wanted to have as part of my experience. That's really cool. Uh, talk to me a little bit about this Rock Ridge neighborhood. You've mentioned it now a couple of times. I'm <laughs> yeah. so curious about it. What is it like a residential neighborhood that has a great, you know, restaurant scene or, or what, what is it like? Yeah. So Rockridge is Oakland's northernmost neighborhood. It's just on the border with Berkeley. It's about a mile south of the UC Berkeley campus. And it's actually a place that, you know, when my husband and I moved to the Bay Area, we just wound up, you know, landing in Rockridge. We found an apartment there. And, you know, I I was consulting at the time for my old employer. And every day I'd break up my, you know, my day, I'd, you know, College Avenue is the main artery. And I'd take my reusable bag and I'd stop at Laferine and pick up, you know, a bag get for lunch or, you know, maybe some tasty cookies for dessert. I'd get to know Jeff who owns La Farine and next door is Verbrugge where Jerry's the butcher. And, you know, I'd ask Jerry, okay, what's great to grill today, Jerry? And you, you get to know everybody in Market Health Foods. And it's just such a great, it's, it's, Rockridge is a, a very, a European um, sort of uh, has a European feel to it where people are just out and about. There's the Asai market that has fresh produce and vegetables and fruits right on the sidewalk. And you just walk up and down the street and there's, it's just filled with small businesses. And it's just, it's such a great neighborhood so that when, you know, when we moved there, it, it really became my community. And 
I was a tour guide. I was a food tour guide in Chicago when I was getting my master's degree. And I just fell in love with just this concept of food tours. So, you know, my husband said, Lauren, you've really gotten to know everybody. We'd walk into La Farina and they'd say, hey, Lauren, like, what do you want today? And, you know, one night we were out with friends and they said that they had taken a, a great food tour in San Francisco. And, you know, he came home and said, you know, Lauren, you really loved giving tours and you love this neighborhood. Like, why don't you start a food tour here in Rockridge? And it started and it just has snowballed from, from there. That is so great. I mean, and and the, the, I understand now, though, though, that you've had to press pause on live tours because of the pandemic. But uh, can you tell me about a tour that you typically offer that customers just really, really love? Yeah. So my Jack London Square tour um, is a really fun one because it starts in San Francisco. And so what I love too is again, exposing people to more parts of the Bay Area. So we start in San Francisco at the Ferry Building. Um, when I first started it, we would um, we frequented uh, Brown Sugar Kitchen. They had an outpost and they're, and they're an Oakland-based restaurant um, that had a uh, restaurant over in the Ferry Building. And so I, again, I wanted to again feature and show showcased East Bay and Oakland restaurants. So we'd have, you know, bra- uh, buttermilk chicken sandwiches from Brown Sugar Kitchen beignets. I'd get their tummies nice and full and we'd take a, thir- <laughs> a beautiful 30 minute ferry ride across the bay over to Oakland. And that ferry ride, I mean, it was just an added bonus for people, especially for people who are outside the area, um, right. because they would get to see, you know, you go, you sail right under the Bay Bridge, you see Alcatraz, you see the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and especially on a beautiful day, you know, it's, you see Alameda and just, and we point out all these different you know parts and there's nothing better than a day on the water mm. and you get to Jack London Square. And I, you know, again, you know, I love when people say, I never expected this from Oakland. I mean, there's, it's a downtown Marina. We have a beautiful hotel that has a, a in-ground pool right on the water. Um, you get beautiful sunny days. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think it is scientifically proven that we do have 10 degrees warmer weather in Oakland than we do in hmm. San Francisco. <laughs> And, you know, and, you know, we eat really yummy barbecue at Everett and Jones. And then I take people through um, the historic warehouse district, which has now been a lot of those warehouses have been co- converted into breweries. So we go to Original Pattern Brewing Company, and it's this really beautiful industrial building with these very large beer vats. And we drink beer and have amazing Taiwanese dumplings. And again, it's, you know, it's neighborhoods that people People, you know, sometimes they don't go to on their own um, and, you know, they want to do that with me and there's beautiful murals on the street and they just, you know, it's just, it's, it's like one of those hidden gems where you're just like, wow, like I totally want to come back here again. Oh, it sounds like an amazing day. Um, oh, it's an awesome day. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to love what you do, right? I mean, yeah. um, do, you, do you find that your guests sometimes discover new cuisines on your tours, like stuff they've never had before? Yeah, like I always love to kind of mix up my tours so that, you know, people have, you know, you know, I, I don't want anybody feeling like, oh, God, I'm going to be trying weird food. So then right. therefore they don't want to come on a tour. Um, you know, so we're always, you know, wood fired pizza from A16, which, you know, who doesn't like a good pizza? Mm-hmm. Um, but then, you know, we'll pair it with um, you know, Taiwanese pot stickers. And so that's something different. And we'll encourage people, you know, really try the spicy chili sauce with it. Um, and then also too, you know, when we're at Market Hall Foods in Rockridge, you know, I really ask our cheesemongers, you know, let's do a pairing that, you know, is safe and simple. Um, we'll do a dried California apricot with, um, Toma from Point Res Farmstead. They're a really great cheesemaker in the North Bay. But then we'll, we'll do another cheese pairing of something that is completely unusual. Um, we did have a group and I really wanted just to surprise them and just make it special. And so what we did was that we took vanilla ice cream and we used shaved aged Gouda on top. Mm. And then we drizzled a dark balsamic vinegar glaze on, on top of that. And mm. everyone was like, really balsamic vinegar? Um, vanilla and aged Gouda, like really? (laughs) And everyone said they all immediately went back into the store and they bought themselves all of it because it's such an amazing combination. If you think about (laughs) it, it's like pop rocks in your mouth with the coldness (laughs) of the ice cream, the sweet, the acid of the 
vinegar, and then just like that really great saltiness from the Gouda. It's just, it's a total explosion mm. in your mouth. And I'm so again, are you salivating serious? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Am I making you hungry? <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's just, it's finding those fun combinations where people are like, oh, I'm not sure about this, but then it's, yeah, that, it, that was pretty good. <laughs> are there other food tours in the Bay Area that we should know about? Oh gosh, there are so many food tours in the Bay Area and also throughout California. So I'll I'll mention a couple of my favorites. So um, in the Bay, immediate Bay Area, um, there's also Edible Excursions, which Lisa also does tours here in the East Bay as well. And what I love is that there are so many neighborhoods to go around. And so if I know Lisa has a neighborhood that she does a tour in, there's no reason for me to do a tour there. I'll say, mm-hmm. listen, you want to see Temescal and you want to eat some Temescal food, go see Lisa. She does a really great tour over in uh, San Francisco. Tom Medine has a, um, he does local tastes of the city and he takes you to a number of different uh, neighborhoods like uh, North Beach and Chinatown. Um, Renee Rebel up in Sonoma, she does gourmet food and wine tours. So she does tours in Sonoma and um, Yauntville over on the Napa side. Um, Heather Fortes in Sacramento does Sacktown Bites. Stacey Giovina has a tour in Carmel. There is so many great tours all across this great state. And so, um, oh, Evan Berger too at Taste Santa Barbara. What I love too is that food tours are predominantly owned by, you know, either an individual operator or very small businesses. You don't tend to see large conglomerates or corporations owning multiple tours across the country and the world. You really, these are kind of small, you know, mom and pop um, enterprises um, because it's, again, it's, individuals who really love where they live, they love their community, and they we've created a way to be able to create a business um, that supports our communities. And, mm-hmm. you know, and the perk is, yeah, do we get to eat really good food all the time? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good perk. It's an amazing perk. My <laughs> husband and my son love it so much, especially, you know, my son is five. And what's interesting, I started my business six months before getting pregnant with him. And so this has become a very amazing business to have <laughs> as a working mom. But part of the reason why I started my ice cream tour was because when I was pregnant, I was eating ice cream all the time. And I said, well, <laughs> why not get paid to eat ice cream? Um, and now, you know, especially pre pandemic, he was my tour guide assistant, he would actually come on the tours with me and help me pass out the ice cream. And he knew that, you know, if you're a good tour guide assistant, you get ice cream at every stop. So he loves, <laughs> he loves when we do ice cream tours together. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> <laughs> well, Lauren, we're gonna have to wrap up soon. But before we do, what's one thing you'd want someone who's never done a food tour before to take away? Don't dismiss it, especially if you're from that area. Don't dismiss a food tour. Because you're going to say, well, why do I need to pay somebody to take me around a neighborhood? I can go to these places on my own. And my thing for you is that I guarantee you will eat something new, you will learn something new, and you will meet someone new. And that's what life is all about. Whether you are on vacation or in your own area, just go on a food tour. They're just really, really fun. And I guarantee you will always have a great time. Yeah, that sounds like a must do. Any new place you go, why not try a food tour? Absolutely. Why Lauren, not? <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, this has been so great. I mean, your passion definitely comes through. Thank you so much for joining us on California Now. Thanks, Satirius. I appreciate this. Lauren Herpick is founder and owner of Local Food Adventures, which you can find online at localfoodadventures.com. As always, we'll have links to all the places we talked about on today's episode and lots more on our website, visitcalifornia.com slash podcast. This is California Now. Thank you for listening to California Now. We hope you enjoyed this episode and get a chance to hit the road soon. This podcast is produced by Visit California. I'm your host, Satirius Johnson. You can find our show on iTunes and Stitcher. Please subscribe. And please check our website for the latest in the way of state travel advisories. It's visitcalifornia.com. California.